Okay, we're good. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Jason Morgan, editor of Fleet Equipment, and welcome to the first episode of Fleet Equipment Unscripted, uh, the video interview series that aims to connect you with um, the top minds in the trucking industry. Uh, my first guest today, Matt Stevens, Vice President of Electric Vehicles at Geotab. Thanks for coming along, Matt. Absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, so just a little bit of background of what we're doing here today. Uh, like many office dwelling industry people, uh, we are self quarantining, we are at home, uh, but still working and still productive. And as someone who's on the road a lot and used to connecting with people after the second day, I started going a little crazy and reached out to some of my friends and said, let's do a video conference call uh, because I, I need to do something and, and find out what's going on in there and, and just stay connected. Uh, so uh, uh, Matt was kind enough to hop on and, uh, and be my guinea pig here. Uh, and so we'll go from there. But Matt, uh, how are you doing over there? How are you weathering the, uh, the work from home self quarantine and what's uh, Geotab as a whole doing to support the customers? Yeah, so Geotab as a whole, we're doing well. So um, I normally work out of the Waterloo office where we have about 100, 100-ish people. So we're one of, one of the, the smaller offices within Geotab. Um, and with our office, about 90, 95% of people are now working from home, me included. So rather than being in our office, I'm nestled in the backwoods of a forest uh, connecting over internet. So, um, but again, from our standpoint, just as you said, a lot of what we do can very easily be done from home. We already primarily use cloud-based systems for just about everything. So we have a handful of people still at the office to make sure that we can get the devices provisioned and shipped out and make sure we can fulfill all the orders of our customers. But each one of them can be really safe because, you know, normally there's 100, 120 people in that office. We have about five there now. So everyone has a ton of space. They can keep a ton of uh, social isolation um, and everything is, everything is clean and proper. And so that way we're able to, people that are in the office, uh, they need to be in the office, can be in the office safely, and then the rest of us aren't. Right, right. No, for sure. Uh, kind of same on, on my end, although I think everybody is out of the office. I, at this point, we're based in Ohio, so clearly Ohio has been pretty aggressive in shutting basically everything down. Um, so, yep, uh, we're staying busy. Uh, all that said, though, the first uh, one of the, the last times we had to connect was at Geotab Connect, uh, where we kind of had some time to sit down and talk about some of the electric vehicle your uh, stuff that, that you're doing on your end. Uh, and I wanted to reconnect with you on that. All things being equal, we know that the world will go back to normal uh, at some point, and we want to make sure that. <laughs> Uh, fleets are ready uh, for that kind of keeping, you know, at least a, a sidelong glance on, on what technology is doing and developing even in this strange time. Or if, hey, if our, if our uh, readers just want to take a break and, and have a fun conversation, let's do a fun conversation. That's what we're here for as well. So I wanted to reconnect with you on that, uh, on that regard. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah, we're still making good progress on all the electric vehicle stuff. I even think in the next Probably in the next day, we'll be announcing that the Go device will support two more Class 8 all-electric vehicles. So I'll hold the suspense, but maybe by the time this goes live, that'll be a, those will be announced. But yeah, for sure. But yeah, as we said, like it's full speed ahead. So we have new EVs in the Class 7, Class 8 uh, segment that are getting supported every day, even now as people are working from home. Um, right. And those those um, firmwares are being committed. So so things are just chugging along exactly as as they were before. Just <laughs> With more space between humans right no for sure i mean we know we're at home but we know that uh fleets across the country are still rolling and, and delivering the stuff everybody needs while we're we're getting through this so i want to back up for a minute uh that's very cool we'll get to that the first thing i want to do though is reconnect on the two announcements you made at connect you unveiled uh two products services information kind of things for fleets the first was an electric vehicle battery degradation tool uh the second was an electric vehicle suitability tool uh, that kind of help fleets navigate whether their their business will will sustain the electric vehicles. How has that been received so far, and what kind of conversations have you had with with customers and fleets that are interested in uh, since the announcement in January? Yeah, so for the electric vehicle suitability assessment, which is where if you already have Geotab devices installed, we basically uh, in software drive electric vehicles on the routes that your current gas or diesel vehicles are taken and then determine would the EV have done the job based on how you're driving and where you're driving on climate matters and would it save you money? So there's a, a pretty simple total costing tool part of it. And so that's what suitability assessment is. 
Um, it was launched for light duty mainly, sort of light up to the, the light commercial van is sort of the window that right now it's released on. So a really a, a lot of positive uptake. It's a it's a free add-in in the in the GeoTab marketplace, and so you know I, I think there was a lot of interest, but also because it's free, it makes it really easy for people to use. And so we've right. seen hundreds of installs from fleets. We've seen them running. Uh, many of them are running many uh, analysis on their fleet to figure out what part of their fleet could go electric today. Getting really positive feedback on it. Probably the biggest point of feedback we're getting is people that run medium and heavy duty vehicles being like, when when can I get this? Uh, which is great. We, we love to see that interest. Um, to do that accurately, we need to be able to understand payload of the vehicle because that has such a big impact on electric vehicles, especially when you get into heavier vehicles. In a, in a passenger car, if there's one or four people, that doesn't make a massive difference on the, on the range capability of that vehicle. But obviously, if you're a tractor trailer, whether it's an empty or full tractor, uh, sorry, trailer matters a lot. And so, so anyway, a lot of interest in the medium heavy duty we're working with a few potential resellers and partners to figure out how we would roll out something similar in medium and heavy duty. So ex exciting things going on in that. Uh, light duty is going well. We've seen a number of fleets uh, now making purchase decisions based on the recommendations, which is okay. great. Um, and so, yeah, so the suitability assessment, really good uptake. We're continuing to improve it because we've also had requests for people in areas outside of North America and Europe, because those were the two jurisdictions that we've supported so far. So a lot of desire out of Latin America and Australia. And so the team's working on that. And then we're working on ways that as new vehicles come to market, as new electric vehicles get rolled out, that we can very quickly and easily add them to the system. Because we only add them once we can make an accurate prediction of that vehicle's performance. And so we need that vehicle to be on the market. We need some data off that real world data off that vehicle to build our software model. And so there's a lot of work that's happened in the last couple of months for us to be able to do that very quickly. Because people are saying, as that Tesla Model Y comes to the market, how quickly can you have that in the suitability assessment? Okay. Um, well, and, and and that's kind of where I want to go with the next question too. And so far as clearly you're you're using data to play a large role in planning for all this. What kind of data points? I know you mentioned payload is a big question mark for seven eight as as you develop that. But in what maybe in the light duty, an example of what other maybe routing or, or other data points you're looking at that that goes into that assessment and gives fleets kind of a clearer picture of how this works. Yeah, so, so generally to go electric, it's a, it's a bit, little bit like the Goldilocks story. So because every mile you drive on electric saves you money, you need to drive enough miles that there's an economic payback, but you can't drive too much that range becomes an issue. And so you're really just trying to find that sweet spot. Now, it just gets a little bit more complicated because the act, exact parameters of that sweet spot depend on the specific electric model you're looking at, what, what's its base range. Sure. But also, how are you driving? Are you doing a lot of highway driving or city driving, high speed driving or low speed driving? Um, and, and climate is a really big factor uh, because electric vehicles are so efficient when it gets, when it, especially when it gets cold out, you don't have the waste heat from the engine that you get to use to heat the cabin and the components. So you actually have to run an electric heater. Uh, and so that's, that's the downside of the powertrain being efficient that you start seeing range go down in cold weather because you need to heat. Uh, usually the driver, but <laughs> also the powertrain to some level. And so that's where climate, how you drive, how much you drive, all those things factor into whether or not an EV would make sense uh, for that specific um, vehicle or lane within your fleet. And so that's where when we do the suitability assessment, we might swallow in data from, you know, 500 vehicles within a fleet and say, here's the 85 spots that can go electric successfully today. And here's the 415 spots that shouldn't go electric right yet yet because some of them the EV won't do the job or it won't save save the money. I see I see and there's an interesting parallel though there though too I think as you, as you were spelling out between that and I mean those are all the considerations that go into diesel uh, powertrain specking and application but I mean I guess to your point we don't know what a lot of the 7-8 class trucks how they're going to perform and even the specking differences within within those uh, uh, electric powertrain architectures. I mean, are you seeing lots of variability there? Is there performance-wise, is it too early to tell or, or are people running this in that heavier space? Uh, yeah, so so on the first thing, it's so just with the with the parallels to diesel, it's 100% the same concept. It's just rather, because within diesel, you have fleet managers and, and specking experts that just innately know, okay, this is the final drive ratio I need for this kind of application. And with electric vehicles, that, that knowledge isn't necessarily as prevalent. And so because we can access such a large database, 
what we're trying to do is just be able to provide that that um, that knowledge, that ability uh, as a free add-in for that for electric vehicles. Just because, so it's it's exactly the same concept, and a really that's a great analogy or, or parallel that you've made. Um, for heavy duty, we don't have enough permutations of you know different final drive setups or different transmission to really understand in the heavy duty case. In the light duty case, and, and so I, 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 I'm, I'm now guessing based on what we're seeing in the light duty because we don't have enough data in the heavy duty to say this with full authority. Um, but in the light duty case, because battery powertrain efficiency curves are pretty flat, and because motor efficiency curves are far flatter than, than a diesel engine or a gas engine, I actually expect that the actual specking will be far more forgiving in an electric vehicle environment hmm. because the efficiency maps aren't nearly as peaky on, in the electric side of the world than as they are in the combustion side of the world. So you'll obviously need to spec right for gradeability, for, you know, for minimum acceleration, but I don't think you're, it's gonna be as sensitive on electric as it is for, um, for combustion fuels. Uh, at least that's what we're seeing in light duty. And so I think the same will be, sorry, I think the same will be true in medium and heavy duty. Yeah, no, that, that, that's super interesting. And I know as, you know, Volvo had their, uh, electric vehicle event uh, where they started rolling that out uh, within their their customer network and their pilot phase here in here in February. Um, Daimler, you know, Freightliner, uh, Kenworth, Peterbilt, they're all running it too. So it'll be interesting to see as those get more and more miles on them and, and as some of that yeah. data comes through and people start using them, how that pans well, out. And actually, so like, I don't think it'll be as sensitive for the for the energy consumption, for the for the mileage, uh, but because of the importance of range, I, well, the delta might only be five or ten percent or fifteen percent. It might matter a lot more in electric heavy duty. Um, and where I think specking might come more into question is in a class seven, class eight uh, liquid fueled uh, tractor or truck. Um, there's not going to be a lot of thought into how big is your diesel tank, <laughs> but but that's where in the electric vehicle side, it's very possible that you'll be able to be uh, to have a, a truck with four or five different battery capacities. So do you want the really small battery or the medium or the big? And that's where you'll really need to understand your specific use cycle. And because the cost of the battery is a big part of the price of the vehicle, that's where getting that the battery spec size right will, will matter. Right. Well, and on, on my end, I think the first of the year, definitely at, at HDAW uh, and then on into TMC and all those other shows was the first time that we heard about really the possibility of, of being able to swap out the batteries. I mean, batteries are the big question. So being able to put ones with greater power, de power density in at a later date, but then the cost. And so still a lot of unknowns there, but I'm, that's, a, that's an interesting point then being able to have kind of a spread of, of battery options then too. Um, well, and that, that kind of gets into the next part, because I think uh, one of the things we've seen from our, uh, our readers and within our, our content analytics is that every time we post now a, a charging infrastructure story, that's the one that will grab some, grab some attention, because that's the next part, right? You got the range, great, but then you got to charge them somehow. How is this uh, data and, data and your, your suitability tool working into a charging infrastructure strategy? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So. When you initially asked, like, what's the feedback? Obviously, I said one of the big things was people asking about medium and heavy duty, and can we do suitability, EV suitability assessment in those spaces. The other thing I didn't actually mention, but it directly is in your question, is a lot of people saying, that's great. You told me that I can, you know, go electric for these 85 vehicles out of my 500, but what is the charging infrastructure I need as a part of that? And it's a great point because in the suitability assessment, at least at this point in time, we don't make any recommendation around charging infrastructure. But a lot of the data you would need to, to be really in, really deliberate and smart about what charging infrastructure you need is captured because it's about where do the vehicle sleep? Like where is their long dwell time? How long are they there for? And how much energy are they gonna need over that time? Because that really helps you if you are doing an infrastructure plan, what you really need to know is how many vehicles, what is, my, what is the power I need and what is the energy I need? And those are really the three parameters. And if you know those three, then you know someone versed in charging infrastructure can easily pick okay if if you need to service you know 40 vehicles at this depot and you need you know x megawatt hours 
and this is the time that you have and the associated power that you need, then you can easily come up with the kind of charging configuration you need for that setup. And that's where there is a lot of nuance and that's where there's gonna be a huge variability in cost because if you can use level two or what we call North America level two, so these, these slower chargers that can be you know, three to 20 kilowatts versus going into the, the fast charging, which in light duty, you're talking 50 to 350 kilowatts in heavy duty, you're talking like two megawatts potentially, uh, or maybe even higher. That's where knowing which, which combination of these uh, charging options you need has a massive impact in both the cost of install and also how quickly you can install. Going back to the battery degradation tool then, how does that play in there? Because I know, I mean, well, I don't know, that's a problem. I don't know how like charging speeds work, how, how frequency works, all that kind of stuff. I know that's still a big question that a, a lot of the industry is working on. What have you seen through the battery degradation uh, tool and, and what might insight do you have there? Yeah, that's a great question. And I apologize, I, I didn't jump into the degradation tool when you originally asked, so yeah, it's perfect time. Uh, so yeah, we, we released a public tool saying this is what we're seeing as degradation from 6,000 EVs. So, so macro level data, people could pick, make, them, make some models. And there is some difference based on the vehicle, whether or not it has liquid cooling or, or passive cooling of the battery pack. But, but one of the things we did find very clearly in the data accelerates degradation is that fast charging. In general, again, we will continue to dive more into that data and we will publish more results for people to, to use as, um, uh, as they as they wish, but we are definitely seeing a statistically significant impact on degradation of fast charging. So if you don't fast charge and you do that level two charging that I was talking about, on average, your battery lasts longer. If you do fast charging, your battery uh, degrades faster. Now, the good news was looking across a very large swath of vehicles, battery degradation is, is generally okay. Um, for the vast majority of vehicles, sorry, I don't mean degradation is good, <laughs> But what I mean is the degradation rates are low enough that for the vast majority of vehicles, that battery will outlast the usable life of the vehicle. So from a very large swath of, of data, we're seeing that the degradation rates are pretty slow. They're average about one to 2% of the capacity per year. That's the average, right? And so if you operate it for 10 years and you're at the 2% range, you'll lose about 20% over that 10 year range. But a lot of the fleets we work with don't even operate their vehicles for 10 years. Well, yeah. Now, what puts you on the faster end is if you're doing a lot of fast charging, you're on the faster end of that range. If you're not doing a lot of fast charging, you're on the slower end of that range. And within the tool and the post, we went through what are some of the factors that either uh, accelerate or decelerate degradation. And, and fast charging was one of the, the, the ones that the data clearly said is one of the things that accelerates degradation. Right. So, but even if I'm, so even if I start speculating on the application of this, they, I mean, even if a fleet has a three to four year trade cycle, they do that because of the cost of the diesel or after treatment service that sends those costs skyrocketing. And if you take that out and now you have a vehicle that will last 10 years and your biggest stuff is, I don't know, the wearables, the brake pads, the tires, which would be pretty standard regardless of the vehicle, I mean, that could, tr that could, that could drastically change this, the equipment trade cycle. Yeah, exactly. And even brake pads, you won't replace them as much because you'll use regen braking for some of the braking. So the, the, the brake pads will last longer, but yes, it just extends on your point even further. Um, hmm. So you'll have tire wear out, but some of the reasons why you swap over a diesel truck at the pace you do, don't, don't apply for EVs. Right now. That's super interesting. It's super interesting. Super interesting. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that's where your choice of infrastructure does impact your degradation rate. At least that's what the data is clearly telling us. We are looking to um, update that tool with a larger set of data because it looks like the impact of fast charging does depend on the vehicle, specifically around the cooling of that battery. Um, and, and so we're, we're trying to make sure that we can give the, the richest insights we can to, to everyone. Um, once all this is in place, right, or once a fleet kind of dips their toe in the electric vehicles, say that, I mean, all things being equal outside of what's going on uh, in the world today, if OEMs were still playing to open order books end of the year, beginning of, of next year for EVs and fleets dip their toe in, what's the telematics data looks like? It seems like there's some parallels here, but I mean, as far as asset utilization, management, that kind of thing, would it is it gonna drastically change what kind of telematics they're looking at is it, or, or will it be pretty comparable? 
So from when the vehicle is being driven, it, it's very similar. It's just a different unit or name, right? So rather than tank level, you're talking about battery state of charge, but it's, it's directly comparable, right? And so the general things you would keep an eye on around utilization and efficiency of fleet are the same. There just might be a different unit you're looking at. Um, where there is a notable difference between traditional telematics and telematics for electric vehicles is around the charging. And this is where telematics doesn't play a massive role in fueling a liquid fuel. Like if you're filling up your diesel tank, okay, you know, obviously we track it for fuel theft. There's a few things that are, are useful for telematics around liquid fuel filling. Um, but when you talk about charging an electric vehicle fleet, especially at a depot, uh, telematics plays an extremely critical role as part of that. You need to know where are all the charging levels, because especially when you're doing slower charging, that charge event is going to take three, four, eight hours. And at a depot, you may have smart charging, which means some of the stations are slowing or speeding up. And so you need that to be done intelligently. Right. So to do that, you need to know what's the charging state of all the vehicles, who needs to go first. And this needs to all happen invisibly to the operator. You, you, you have to not have to worry about it. The system needs to do the smart decision about who gets full juice, who gets half juice, who needs to be slowed down. Right. And so that's where there's a big difference in the telematics requirement around the, the energy fill of the vehicle because you don't need a lot of, you use it in traditional diesel telematics um, but you use it a lot more in electric vehicle telematics. Right, right. I've, I, I've gotten into that with a couple of charging infrastructure providers right. as well, wow. even down yeah. to the point where the software that's on the truck needs to match the charging, uh, charging station, even if you have the same plug, which not everybody has the same plug, so you still got to change the plugs. But even if you have the same plug and it goes in, if the software doesn't match up, it might not charge the truck, right? It has to talk to the truck and be able to show that. So that's super interesting. Yeah, so there's a lot more on the charging side. And then also when you talk about electric charging, um, the cost of charging at the perfect time versus the, the, op <laughs> the worst time, you're usually talking about, in the, it depends on where you live and your utility and your contract with them, but you're easily talking about a five or 10 times difference between charging at the perfect time and charging at the worst time. And when you're filling up with diesel, you know, you're not somewhere between $2 a gallon and $20 a gallon, depending on what time of day you're filling. Right. But in electric charging, that, that is effective. Again, all the numbers are lower <laughs> because it's more efficient and, and cheaper to operate. But the idea that there's a 10 times difference between charging at the best time versus charging at the worst time is, is quite common. Well, right. And I mean, I know I've even just um, talked in passing with fleets and, and and manufacturers and so far as well, how could it change the, the duty cycle then, right? If you're charging during the day and the trucks are quiet and you can run them at night, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and I think as we go, there's definitely more sophisticated ways to eke out the last couple cents uh, per mile, um, but, but even just having a good telematic system and infrastructure, and I'm not trying to get into pitching, but just that's where the good systems can just handle 80, 90% of the benefit for you without you having to become an expert on it, without you having to worry about it. The, system, like the, the logic and the rules are pretty well known and you just need a system to just take care of it for you. And, and that's where the, the good systems um, can just do most of the lift without someone having to be, become a, a full expert on electricity rate tariffs and demand charges and all those fun things that right. you know, no one really wants to be a pro in. No, and, and to your point, uh... Fleets are already understanding the, how to leverage technology to run their current equipment more efficiently and more productively. And that same, that same thing is going to happen with electric. Fleets have multiple nameplates. They'll have multiple nameplates of electric. All the electric OEMs right now will have their own software on the truck, just like they have their own telematics. But having a, having a third-party solution can help kind of level that, give you a bird's-eye view across everybody there. It's kind of the same, yeah. like you said, different metrics, kind of same <laughs> principle. It is, yeah, and, and it really our focus is, you know, whether or not it's the device that comes from the manufacturer on the vehicle when you buy it, or it's an aftermarket device that plugs in. It doesn't doesn't matter, you know. Just that data needs to come to a single spot, and then and then uh, manage the charging and the operation and give the fleet what they need. And so there just has to be that abstraction layer where the fleet manager or the facility manager can go and see all the vehicles in their fleet or depot and and, and manage accordingly. 
for sure. Okay, one last question. I guess I'll kind of I'll throw a little bit of a curveball here, and, and let's think back before we were stuck at home, right, and all this happened. What were your conversations uh, with fleet customers in terms of how they felt about electric technology uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, what their interest level was at? Is it viable kind of on a holistic sense, or is it still just kind of a, a solutions-based technology? Um. I, my, my default answer is I don't think I've, I've really seen really any difference in the discussion between six weeks ago and now. I'm just trying to make sure that that's a, just the, all the conversations are happening remotely, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, so they're still happening. They're still happening, yeah. And, and so even internally, I got a question about with, with, with oil prices being so low, are we seeing a change in people's appetite for EVs or even that EV suitability assessment? And we're not, uh, at least at this point. And when we talk to fleets about what in that suitability assessment, you put in your estimated cost of fuel of, of diesel, um, and they're still putting in numbers notably higher than what we're seeing you know, at pumps today. And when we ask why, they say, well, because I'm buying this truck, I'm gonna operate it for four years. And my assumption is, well, there might be a depression now and there's you know, an oil war going on between OPEC and Russia, and obviously there's you know, COVID. Um, those things will eventually go by. And if I'm looking to buy a truck and take delivery in three to four months, and I'm gonna operate it for four years, what I need is the average cost for that four year window. Right. And the benefits of going electric aren't just the total costing, you know, in heavy duty vehicles, it's the ability to maintain speed up a grade. Like that's, that's high value, that's a safety feature for someone operating a tractor trailer in a hilly environment. Um, there's the, the reduced maintenance. So there's all these factors and so, I guess my answer is I would have expected a slightly, I wouldn't have expected a, a fall off on interest, but maybe a, a little bit of a reduction in interest because of, because of oil prices, not because of COVID, but obviously those are interrelated. Um, but we're really not seeing any material change. Um, all the fleets are going electric. They're still going electric. In some jurisdictions like Europe, it's because of regulatory policy. It's because of low uh, clean air zones, low emission zones. Those are still there. They're not going anywhere. Right. So, so I, I'd say, honestly, it, it, other than all our conversations happening remote, there, there really hasn't been a noticeable difference yet. Okay. Okay. Well, very cool. And a, and a really good perspective to keep in mind. I think I know, you know, as the person that's churning out the news, gosh, every minute of, of the day now, uh, keeping up with all this stuff, it's, you know, it's, it's important to know that, to your point, fleets are the, you know, they have the long-term view in mind. Yes, you got to deal with what's happening today, but that that these plans are made well in advance. Uh, and yeah, and I just got the the purchase breakdown for the next couple quarters from one of the client, one of our, you know, one of the fleets we support, and uh, their their purchase plan includes forty percent electric for the next six months. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, full charging ahead. <laughs> good to hear. Good to hear. Um, All right. <laughs> well, Matt, thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate you you coming on and, and doing something fun here and, and taking a break from your, your busy schedule there at home, I'm sure. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe. Um, we'll, uh, we'll touch base with you soon again. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Jason. Thanks. Elbow bump. Elbow bump. That's right. <laughs> Thanks.